I think we went into the... You let me know, Sarah, when, um, when you'd like me to start letting everybody in. What do you think? I think we give them till like one, right? Just to one moment. So I'll ask Dina the first question and then I'll try and listen out for an appropriate moment where we can um, switch between each of you. I'm really looking forward to it. It should be very interesting. Thank you, Sam. Sounds good. Yeah. So it's dead on one o'clock. Should I um? Should I probably? I've already sent a little message actually just to everyone in the waiting room. Should I probably admit them and um, yeah, you, yeah, wait a few moments? Maybe if you just introduce yourselves, I'll start to let everybody in now. Okay. Yeah. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I can see just a few more people are joining us. So it's my pleasure to wish everyone a really warm welcome to um, our final Spotlight Seminar of this year um, on the theme of the image of refugees in the media. Uh, so th thanks so much for joining us at this lunchtime. Um, I'm Jenny from the Media Communications Department and it's my pleasure to um, convene and host these events. Um, today, I have two uh, fantastic guest speakers who I'm really excited to introduce. Um, the first speaker is Christian Skia, um, who is my colleague at Webster. He's a photographer and adjunct professor and also in our media communications and photography department. Um, he's Norwegian originally and a Swiss-based photojournalist. And he's worked with a number of organizations over the years, including Aga Khan, Enfant du Monde, WTO, Holocaust Memorial Day, uh, and many others, and also for many different publications, including the International Herald Tribune, the Daily Telegraph, Le Temps, uh, 24 Heures, Banker Magazine, Neue Zürcher Zeitung, and others too. Um, so his main work at the moment has been uh, involved with dealing with the aftermath of war, in particular life to date in Srebrenica, Bosnia and Rwanda. And actually, Christian has just been given an honorable mention in the 2021 Budapest International Photo Awards for his ongoing project, People on the Move. So congratulations for that, Christian. It's lovely to see your work and such a worthwhile theme being given recognition. Our second speaker is Dina Ionesco, who um, until fairly recently was the head of Migration, Environment and Climate Change Division at IOM. Her current role is a senior advisor for the UN, UNFCC Secretariat, UN Climate Change, with a focus on human mobility and collaboration with non-regional governmental fora, including in particular the Climate Vulnerable Forum. And Dean is also uh, shortly becoming my colleague at Webster, where she's going to be co-director of our new MA in Migration, Climate Change and the Environment, uh, which we're really excited to launch uh, later in 2022. So thank you both so much for joining me to discuss this important theme. And the first question I wanted to ask Ashley is to, is to Dina. Um, I'd love you to tell us a little bit more about yourself and why you became so passionate about refugees and climate change. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Um, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be in this webinar uh, today. So this is very nice of you, Sarah, to, to offer me the opportunity to, to start by speaking a bit about myself. Dina, give me, uh, the sound doesn't seem to be very perfect. I don't know if that's the same for everybody or if it's just for me. No, that's right. I think the, the volume is, maybe the volume of the microphone is a little bit low, Dina, all of a sudden. We can hear you perfectly a moment ago. So. Is it better now? A little bit better, it's still, it's still quite low. Uh, maybe we can we can try. Maybe if we increase our volume on our computers, <laughs> on the phones. Is it better now? Yes, yes. that's better. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I I start to manage the technicalities. <laughs> Okay, so yes, thank you, Sarah. No, I was saying I'm, I, I find it, uh, it's, uh, I feel very uh, grateful that you asked me to start by just connecting, in fact, my work with a bit my own story. Uh, and I must say that, yes, I think that uh, the fact that I, I, I was myself a refugee uh, was quite a life-changing 
um, experience for me. Uh, and just to say the background, it's that I'm my family, so half of my family ran away from Romania under the dictatorship, communist dictatorship to France. And half of it, including me, stayed in Romania almost two years, uh, waiting to, to run away as well. And then we were brought uh, through the family reunification uh, procedure uh, that allowed me also to, to, to come to France with my mom. So I have the experience of being left behind and then starting something new from a day to another. Uh, from what I would like to bring maybe into our discussion today on refugees from my own experiences, I think that uh, once you live through that, you have the realization that you are going through uh, the heart of emotions of a human being that allow you to be both sad and happy in the same time. So that's quite amazing. You are very sad because you left everything. You realize that you are 13 years old and you will return to what you left only maybe, you are not sure ever, or maybe just when you are 20. Uh, but, and you are sad because you left your family as a 13 year old, you left your cat and you are very sad about it. Uh, you left friends and, and so much of yourself. And at the same time, you, you took everything with you and, and start something new and you feel extremely happy and extremely accelerated. I found I was, I felt very empowered and excited and very grateful also to have this opportunity with, uh, to start a new life. So for me, that's what I always bring in my work, these nuances of uh, refugees, not um, heroes nor um, victims, but at the heart of human emotions with everything we go through. Uh, so that's one of the key things I take with me from this, um, this experience. Also, I think I, I took with me the fact that it's so important where do you arrive and how you are cared for when you arrive and what kind of uh, space to, to start a new life you have, who takes care of you, who introduces you to your new life, what opportunities you have, and education being the key. Uh, opener for for this new life so for me this is also something that um, that it's really important and also I would add that I felt that it's a challenge that can be transformed in an immense opportunity and that's for forever with me as well what stays also forever with me it's also why 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 are we obliged to get there how is it possible that we have countries that turn against their own people and you have to run away and you are not able to cross even a border so this why and how stays with me forever and guides my work and sometimes makes me a bit too passionate also about this topic <laughs> that it maybe it's not good for 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 the professional uh image but uh yes that's uh i think that's a, a strong driver well, thank you so much for starting us off with that, that blend of tragic and also so optimistic as well, um, highlighting the challenges and also the, the potential of the situation and for sharing also your human story. Christian, I know that you don't share a background personally as a refugee, um, as Dina does, but your work is certainly informed by different personal experiences working with refugees. So I'm wondering if Tell us a little bit more about what motivates you so strongly to work on this project as a humanitarian photographer. Yes, very true. Very different to Dina's. Uh, I, I'm not at all a refugee um, or have ever been. I have, though, over the last 10 years, worked closely with uh, post-war situations, particularly post-genocide. Uh, hence working in places like uh, Bosnia, Rwanda, in Iraq, where, where this has, uh, uh, where I've been doing most of this, and this is very closely linked to my work at Webster as well, um, being one of the advisors of the Webster Humanitarian Association. Um, coming along on some students trip there uh, triggered a lot of curiosity. Uh, and I, I guess what is, makes this work a little bit differently than traditional editorial work you see from uh, particularly the conflict uh, areas, is that my focus was never really on where the <laughs> explosions were going on. I was more curious about the people themselves. Um, the focus has been 
quite firmly on how people manage to uh, continue their lives after going through uh, these kind of strong experiences. Uh, it started in Srebrenica, where I met many survivors of the genocide, uh, and, and hearing their stories, talking to them, getting to know them, and then trying to understand how they, how they managed to continue to, to, to live relatively normal lives. Uh, an example of that is a friend of mine, Hassan Hazanovic, who's, who's married, he's got a daughter, um, and we became good friends over, over time. And, uh, you know, we're roughly the same age, we have daughters the same age, etc. So, so we had a lot of things in common too. Uh, only he did lose a twin brother, a father, uh, several uh, cousins, etc. And of course that has had a huge dramatic effect on his life uh, afterwards. Uh, and I think it was this that kind of triggered this, this idea of trying to kind of continue to, to, to not directly compare necessarily, but to, to understand how different people uh, live through their lives. Uh, inevitably, when you work on this topic, you are going to come across people on the move too, uh, various stages of being refugees or migrants in one way or another. Uh, and, and I met many in different places. And during the last four years, approximately, we've been living with my family in Sarajevo, uh, and I, where, where she's involved in development work there, and I was involved in continuing to my work on this life after genocide as a broad term of, of the work I've been doing in, in, the, in various ways. Um, since 2015, when Turkey and the European Union agreed on closing the European borders for refugees, uh, I mean, in order to simplify what happened. I mean, that's roughly what happened. Uh, there's been this huge problem uh, on what is called or known as the Balkan route. And the biggest problem in, on that route is in Bosnia, because this is kind of the last frontier before the refugees managed to cross into the European Union. And living in Bosnia allowed me to kind of explore better, starting to understand, getting to know people who were trying to kind of get to Europe from various parts of the world. And uh, and then you realize this, and this is just another link to life after war in a way, but perhaps not always genocide, but I mean, war at least, uh, and, uh, and all that means. Um, so over the last couple of years, I, I focused heavily on the refugee situation in Bosnia and the people who are stranded and stuck in Bosnia and collecting stories, uh, to some extent testimonials and, and and realizing how frustratingly and difficult and dangerous and violent their everyday situation is. So when you experience that or meet these people, it's impossible not to have an interest in it. <laughs> and when you start working on it, it becomes like a, an ongoing project, which will probably never properly finish, I don't think, because you don't finish relationships with friends. No, of course not. I mean, your your um, commitment to telling those stories and your compassion clearly comes across, as does their resilience. Um, but what I was thinking when I was listening to you is, why is it so important to document those stories in the form of images as a photographer? Well, uh, photography for, for, I think, many documentary uh, photographers, filmmakers or anything, you see this is another way of communicating and that means photography to many ways in many ways is, is just another language somehow I mean that, that's how we try to sort of um, to use it and I think we can write about it we can know about it and and I think all actions are needed uh, but to 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 be there and to be with people is another way of having a different proximity to, to these people. We hear that right now there's somewhere between five and 9,000 people stuck in Bosnia. Uh, that's a big number. But when you meet them and see them and realize they just look, they look just like you and me, uh, that's a difficult situation where they are. They look almost happy. I mean, what's going on? You know, it, it triggers another kind of emotional response to what's happening rather than reading about the numbers in that sense. I think therefore it's important to be there. It's important to show, in my case, I think it's important also to show the, the continuation of their existence there. That's why I always tend to revisit people that I meet. I, I never visit them only once. Uh, if they see me once, they're, they're likely to be stuck with me for a while over multiple visits. Because I think that, that historical uh, 
in a way, sort of aspect that you put on, on, on getting to know people over maybe several years or several months or whatever it is, uh, it can be only a few weeks too sometimes. Uh, I think that's important because it, it's a bit like, <laughs> remember this picture? Sorry, I'm not giving up on it. Here is him or she again. Uh, and you start to build this relationship, getting to know people and getting to know their stories. An example was this in uh, in Bihar to northern Bosnia where, where all these people are stranded more or less. Uh, I was chatting to a guy, we were walking around in one of those abandoned buildings, uh, factory situation area where they are. And we were talking, this guy was very helpful. And suddenly his phone rang. I mean, his phone rang constantly. And he had the one phone for his group of approximately 10 people. And I said, oh, sorry, Christian, wait, wait for a minute. It's my family. And he was talking to his family in Afghanistan. So, hey, say hi to them, Christian. You know, like he was sort of showing the, the, the phone up like this. And I was talking to them. Uh, you never know if that picture will ever be interesting. But at the same time, it shows that normality to it. And for me, this is part of continuing to live, continuing to function somehow. Of course, that phone meant a lot more to him than it does to me in the sense that it's also his navigational equipment, it's also his contact for help equipment, is, is everything somehow, you know, for him and the other 10 guys that shares it with him. Uh, but I think this, uh, this, this thing is important and this you can not, you can write about it, but much more people will r realize it if they can see the pictures. So it creates a kind of deep human connection as well with these individuals that we can meet through your photographs, who we may otherwise never have a privilege of meeting. Um, Absolutely. Creating an emotional connection with them too, through your, through your images. It's like this uh, legend of a photographer, um, uh, James Nachtway said once, uh, that in a way, I wish everybody could experience conflict for just 15 minutes in their life. Unfortunately, that's impossible, but at least we can inform the, the few of us who see difficult situation, we can share with them and hopefully that can help a little bit. You know, it's a way to kind of exchange that or make that circle somehow. Thanks, Christian. <clears throat> I wanted to move briefly from images to the words. And Dina, the words we use to understand and frame these events are crucially important. And we know there can be many different reasons that might drive people to become refugees. Um, you mentioned a little bit some of the, like the um, events that cause people to become refugees uh, when you spoke earlier. And we're increasingly hearing in the media about climate um, and human rights activists referring to climate migrants. So what is the reality of people moving because of climate change? And, the and what's the impact of using these different terms? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, I think it's uh, from moving from what Christian presented yeah. uh, in words <laughs> for the moment about uh, his, uh, uh, his pictures. I think what comes again, it's the, the, the human being at the center of this and that we can speak about these uh, stories in so many different ways. We can speak in legal terms, we can speak in political terms, in very technical, bureaucratic, uh, psychological, social, you can use poetic, artistic ways of speaking. At the end of the day, nevertheless, it's true that when you, you work on this uh, dimension of migration and refugees, there are very specific also uh, legal categories and uh, we need very good data in order to be really evidencing the realities of contemporary migration movements. So it's indeed very important to know what we talk about beyond the metaphors uh, beyond the, the compassion and beyond um, the, the, the images, because it's also what you, you, you speak about can be a question then of concrete life change for a person. If you make believe people that they can become, for instance, climate refugees, uh, it's not true in our contemporary world, and it can lead to a dangerous, I think, and sad situation for some people who might believe that this is possible and it's not. So to come back to, to your question, I think it's very important to know uh, very well how refugee status is being defined. 
when uh, are you a refugee, when you cross an international border, when you uh, have to show that it's a well-founded fear of being persecuted, for what reasons, for race, religion, political opinions, nationality, membership to a, to a group. Uh, so this all is framed under the uh, Geneva 1951 Convention. And in addition to this, the refugee status has evolved over the years also with different uh, conventions and uh, new um, resolutions or decision or thinking around the refugee status. In particular, 1969 and 1984, the Cartagena Declaration, they have somehow extended uh, the refugee distinction by also thinking more about um, events that can really put into um, a life threatening situation people by disturbing public order. So we are here now in this discussion with now trying to understand how climate change and how environmental degradation and disasters also come into the picture. So the realities of people moving because of the climate change impacts on their livelihoods because of environmental degradation, lack of resources, and because of disasters, the reality of it, it's very much in fact, internal migration. So people in general do not cross borders. So that's why somehow this debate on climate refugees after seeing that as a refugee, you have to cross a border. It's a big, maybe a bit wrongly uh, framing the, the or missing on the bigger picture. So I think it's very important to understand that a lot of these movements are internal, uh, then a lot of them intra-regional, and then some of these movements are international. There's a lot to be done more maybe at urban level, for instance, or agriculture, development, climate adaptation. And I think all the things that are very important to understand about the reality of people moving in the context of climate change today it's uh, the multi-causality of this migration. Mm -hmm. And that has an impact on everything that it's legal or uh, operational to respond to this challenge because the multi-causality makes it very complex. Environmental drivers in majority are connected to other drivers, in particular demographic or uh, political or uh, economic loss of jobs. So it's very difficult sometimes to disentangle this multi-causality. So what we know very well today, it's data on people who move and are displaced, in fact, by disaster, in particular, sudden onset disasters like floods. And this is the international, um, the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center has worked uh, on this a lot. Also IOM with its displacement tracking matrix. We know also projections about people moving because of slow onset, but that's much more difficult. And we can talk maybe more about this uh, later. I, I think I stop here because I, uh, that's a, a first step to, to bring in this dimension into our discussion on, on refugees. Yes, I'm and refugee also, images in particular, I think. Yeah, I'm also wondering, I was very curious what you said about how the categories and the way they're used in the media also frames the expectations of people who may want to become refugees yeah. or migrate in some way because of that. So what's your opinion? Why is it maybe difficult to establish climate refugee as a legal category? And do you think that the media framing of refugees supports or hinders these efforts? <laughs> Uh, yes, we are in a, in, a, in a webinar discussing media images, so uh, I think it's a very important question to get there. I would say, why is it so difficult? I think one of the key things is that, first of all, we come from a world where climate change issues and migration issues are still too much politicized and, and get into a debate that it's not necessarily practical, technical, uh, concrete. And so it's like a double kind of passion and double sensibility, sensitivity about it. So that already makes it difficult. And second, I think what I said about isolating uh, environmental uh, driver, it's the key difficulty on creating such a status. And then also the complexity of migration, as I said, because it's internal, then it's a human rights uh, story yeah. and not an international protection in a third country 
by a third country or international protection for someone crossing a border. So I think it's, it's very difficult to, to also not think that, uh, and there it gives us some insights on the media issue. It's also that we present it in such a negative way that we forget that migration is also a very um, normal and human kind of response to adapting. And so that a lot of this migration, it's not in fact running necessarily away in a very forced way, but it's still a choice. Might be a constrained choice, but it's still a choice. So it's still part of the positive dimension of migration and should not necessarily see be seen as persecution, prosecution, and, and the negative bit of it. But having said that, there are numerous initiatives that try to, in a way, uh, craft better the reality of climate change and refugee status. For instance, the Nansen Initiative and the Nansen Initiative Protection Agenda for cross-border movements because of disaster and climate change has tried to provide uh, an explanation and, and to, to provide solutions on this protection gap for people crossing a border. But they ended up by also coming with a toolkit of many policy responses. So not either uh, saying climate refugee is the only response. And then the Global Compact on Refugees has now recognized that climate, environmental degradation, and disaster together uh, have an impact on uh, reasons that might lead to someone becoming a refugee, but it's still also not saying directly that that's what the solution and only solution is for people moving in the context of climate change. So we need a nuance, many nuances of policy responses. And that brings me to your question on the media. It's, I think that the issue, it's very often the lack of nuances. So in the same time, when you, when you are presenting the, the tragedy of a situation, you, you are obliged to show the, the, the negativity and the difficulty and what people go through. But I think um, we need much more um, media presentation that are more balanced on the evidence. For instance, to be very clear that when we speak of people living in areas that, for instance, are low-lying uh, delta areas, we are speaking of people at risk from climate change impacts. We are not necessarily speaking of migrants. We might speak on the contrary of trapped populations who can't move out. So I think there are so many different uh, stories that need to be brought in um, that we sometimes focusing on the, very much only on a climate refugee status might lead to forgetting, in fact, the reality of many other stories, and in particular, the, poly, the, the beautiful stories. And, and sec, maybe last point, I would say also, there's a very strong focus on sudden onset disasters, that yeah. it's also very visible in the media. So whenever there is a big catastrophe, of course, this will be mm. very much in the news, but then the very difficult bit is the very slow onset. Uh, yeah. part of the story. So extreme heating, extreme heat, we know that some areas won't be habitable anymore. But to project migration, it's so difficult for this area. So then it's very difficult also to have this on a daily basis in our news. So I would ask for more nuances, uh, more also positive stories, a lot of voice to the people who 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 are affected. And I think that work like Christians, it's central because that gives the, brings you the emotion and the reality of it and uh, into, into your, your thinking and your, your work. Just a quick final question to you before we take a look maybe at some of Christian's images as well. Do you think that state should support the creation of a category of climate refugees? Um, or do you think there should be an alternative solution? So I think once again, that nothing is just black and white. And also there are uh, tentatives uh, to create, uh, there are universities who try to create like new conventions that would 
uh, showcase uh, how we could have a climate refugee status. We had also two very interesting cases that got a lot of media attention, one from Kiribati and one from Bangladesh very recently that bring to the attention of the greater audiences, again, the difficulty of having a status on climate refugee and the idea that maybe there are nevertheless other kind of solutions that respond to the issue. So the Kiribati case, it's between a Kiribati national and a New Zealand. And in fact, it's a very interesting case where the Human Rights Council also uh, produced a decision and um, that in a way has been seen by many as the first one to open up the idea of a climate refugee status, but which in reality, it's more a human rights, again, uh, response. So they use the principle of no refoulement, so that not a person cannot be returned to a country where his life would be in danger. Nevertheless, in the case of this Kiribati national, the issue was the threshold how when is it life threatening or not and so it was not a case of climate refugee and the bangladesh one uh, at the end the person in bangladesh is in france and i think he can he stayed in france but for health reasons so nothing to do again with climate change or pollution or but on humanitarian grounds so my response to your question whether states should create or not i think it's many folded first of all i think there's very little appetite when you work with international uh in an international organization you work with states and you realize that there is very little support to the idea of first of all opening up existing tools on yeah. refugees to climate uh, discussion because of all these complexities first of all um, second, I think I'm afraid somehow that it's a like a good intention that turns into the opposite that it wants to achieve. So, for instance, that we create, in fact, a new boxing category for people where it's very difficult to prove that it's climate change impact related and we end up with people who might in and others not in for very a meager uh, kind of, uh, of uh, reasons. And so poverty doesn't help you, but climate change allows you to have the status. So it's not a very good, I think, a resolution either. And, and third, I think there are many other alternatives. And here I would comment rather um, connect to the global compact on migration that has been approved in the same year in 2018 as the Global Compact on Refugees. The Global Compact on Migration speaks much more about climate change impacts uh, than the Global uh, the Compact on Refugees and recognizes climate change drivers and environmental degradation drivers. And through this compact, you see that there are multiple possible other solutions that are in fact rather migration solution, migration policy, migration practice solutions are not necessarily a convention on climate refugees. And for instance, you have the question of visas, uh, temporary visa, humanitarian visa, um, entry and stay, consular services, labor migration, reintegration, all migration policy and practice tools can be ways to respond to this question of people moving in the context of, of climate change. And there are numerous now regional responses mm -hmm. that, uh, for instance, uh, the Eastern Africa Free Movement Protocol now at regional level recognizes disaster and environmental uh, drivers. So I really think that there are many ways to respond in a different way. And of course, also, once again, it's not just about migration policy. It's about development policy. It's about uh, human rights. It's about climate action. It's about investing in the environmental policy so, so that people do not have uh, to move in a forced way on the longer term and that we, we don't need uh, such a category at the end of the day. Uh, so, yes, I, I'm much more in convinced that alternative solutions can take us farther and be more 
um, adapted to this question than a narrow uh, climate refugee only focus. Thanks, Dina. And what actually really comes through in your response is that is when we look at individual stories and cases that the nuances and the challenges come out. Um, that was really clear when you talk about the Kiribati case. Um, Christian, I wanted to go back to you to talk a bit more about the images. And please feel free, I think you prepared some images somewhere. So at an appropriate moment, please feel free to share your screen and show us some of your beautiful photography of people on the border. Um, but I wanted to ask you about the challenges of taking images in such a sensitive humanitarian context. And I know, um, because we work together, I know that ethics are really of a central concern in your work. So how do you go about taking photographs in places where you might not be very much welcome? Christian, you're on mute. Is that better? That's much better, thank okay. you. <laughs> I will answer that in a couple of different ways. Um, uh, and also uh, partially in response to what we've just been uh, listening to as well from Dina. Um, Perhaps the best is just to kind of run a slideshow in the background while I talk. It's much, much better to look at that than me, I think. Um, okay, is that here probably working? Back. And then I will try to do this. And I can do this. And I can just run. And then uh, I don't know what you guys see now. Do you see pictures? Yes. Okay. okay. So this can work. This is a bit from Bosnia. These are. Bosnian people, local people in Bosnia, as well as refugees, is a mix and match, and there, there are various reasons for that. Um, first of all, a little bit about photography and representation of media in some of these contexts. I think it's important to remember, too, that uh, who's your target audience? Who are the media trying to communicate to? Uh, and, and that seems to be a problem. I remember talking to Afghan refugees in Bosnia who explain how they were sold a trip to go to Europe at the local market. So they were paying between five and $10,000. Uh, that was put onto a frozen bank account uh, to the smugglers. And when they sent a video back home showing they were in Paris or in Stockholm or in Berlin or wherever they were in London probably, uh, then the money would be released. And I think I want to go to Afghanistan because I want to see these markets where this is going on. You know, what, what are the trips that these guys are selling? They're also, to some extent, using media to say, you can do this. Um, another thing is that uh, European media oftentimes like to show what kind of a migrant uh, catastrophe we have in Europe. And it's true that we have a, a situation in Europe, but we're barely touching the top 10 list in the world in terms of migration in Europe. Uh, and this is also problematic because it's not necessarily the way we see it if we read regular media. And then again, it's also the appetite for media. I tell you, it's very difficult to get these stories into ordinary media in, in Europe because newspapers, as I was talking to a well-known editor in Swiss Roman, she tells me very well, you know, Christian, I'm super interested in these stories. I hope you will continue to share them with me. The problem is, though, most of our readers rather want to read about what happened to the neighbor dog who disappeared yesterday. So it, it, it's hard to, to grab the attention as well sometimes. Uh, when it comes to working with people, migrants, or with anyone else, uh, I like to think that I work with people, <laughs> whether you're a refugee or if you're a CEO of a big company or you're a football player, in the end of the day, you talk to people. Um, when I talk to students about photographing people, I say that in the end of the day, your job as a photographer, you're only doing half the job because your job getting images is a collaboration between you and the people you're, uh, you're photographing. So it's about being courteous. It's about finding a way to communicate. Sometimes you may not speak the same language, but then you have to find a way to communicate together. Nevertheless, and these days that's easy. Uh, if you need specific words, you use a Google translation application and you can talk to each other in pretty much any language. Uh, and I think if we have a, a normal, good way of talking to people and you show genuine interest, there are ways uh, to, to, to break these barriers. Uh, and this 
uh, th this is about anything in life, I think. Uh, but one thing which is important to may perhaps remember, though, that I think is also we should also remember when you work in communities where that are maybe not the most ordinary communities. So you're working whether you're close to a place where conflict has happened or you're working in large migrant situation. Most of the picture, pictures in my or, or, or mine here are people that are so-called illegal refugees. They're not even in camps. You know, they're, they're living randomly in woods or in abandoned buildings. So they're not part of the ordinary statistics. So many of these people want to be relatively anonymous. At the same time, people also are aware of their situation. Um, an example of that is, you know, if, if people are, for example, burying a child or something, in a normal situation here in Lausanne or in Geneva or something like that, I would not walk up to parents burying a child. You know, you will show a certain respect and keep your distance, right? When you're in a very complicated situation like this, uh, the situation is different. And the people in this situation, they know that too. So they often are happy to share this because they know that you're trying to tell their stories to others. So when, you, when people in a certain situation, they will accept more and actually they will appreciate your interests as well. Uh, and I think oftentimes it, it comes across if you have a genuine interest or if you're there to kind of just grab a trophy type of a picture. Uh, and in most cases, this is not the case. Uh, and I think that that's, that's, a, uh, that's a situation that's important to be aware of. And this often has to do with how you research your topic before you start photographing. Um, and that includes understanding a little bit about the communities you're about to meet. In the pictures you see now, you have people typically from the Middle East, you have people from uh, everywhere from even Iran, Pakistan, Afghanistan, you have a lot of Bangladeshi people, you have people from North Africa. And if you're reporting from amongst these communities, it's also your obligation to understand a little about uh, these communities and why they're there. Uh, sure, I, th I think that's, it's about uh, breaking that, that barrier. Yeah, so you very much navigate the challenges from a human perspective. Oh, absolutely. Which is the ethical perspective. It's not even just the ethical perspective. I think it's the only real perspective. I mean, it, it, it may be different if you're being sent to photograph something to, to grab a headline newspaper uh, of some sort uh, saying that something happened. You know, the, the, the Lipa camp in Bosnia burned down. They're there to photograph. Okay, then you have to photograph the burnt down camp. Uh, but this is a little bit more longer term and anything longer term, whether it's about refugees or anything else, um, is about normal human relationships. Yeah. And, and it doesn't really matter so much what the topic is, I think. Uh, the context, the way you work, you need to research and understand. But that to me is a little bit of a different matter. And this I almost take for granted that yes, you do that. Apart from that, you deal with people. You deal with people, absolutely. Mm. Um, as time is getting on, it, I, I think it's an appropriate moment to open up to the audience if they would like to ask any questions. So we have a good amount of time for Q and A. If that's okay with both of the speakers at this point. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, of course. Excellent. So therefore, if anyone um, with us would like a question to ask a question to either or both of the speakers. Um, please go ahead and either speak to us directly, or you're very welcome also to share a question if you'd like to in the chat, and I'd be very happy to um, read that out for, on your behalf. Ingrid? Yeah, I, I had a question. Um, I had a question for, um, um, for a, a Christian. Um, I wondered, because um, I also like to learn and work a bit more with um, um, officials uh, as well in, in, in my research, but um, I myself st struggle with the um, uh, increasing rules and regulations um, there are about um, using visuals and especially if people's faces uh, are on there. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that it requires uh, then have to ask a paper consent form so everybody and um, 
So I just wondered how, how, how I can understand, of course, if you work with uh, someone um, for a long time and more one to one, that that that's all feasible. But just more generally, I wondered how how you yeah how you mm -hmm. uh, deal with that. It's it, it's a good question, um, and it, uh, frankly, th there are some general rules on this, uh, and there are also specific rules depending on which country you're working in. Um, in general, though, when you're in a public space and it's a news or information worthy topic you're working on, uh, you have the right to photograph people. Uh, no one can come and stop you and saying, no, you cannot. Photo I mean, there are exceptions, right? If you're in a military installation, for example, or at an airport or something like that, uh, that's different. But in general, in public areas, people cannot stop you from photographing in general. Right? And uh, there are exceptions. For example, there's some exceptions in places, even like London, there are exceptions in Geneva, if you're at the train station, for example, even in the non-important uh, non areas where you need permission. Um, having said that, I mean, one thing is what's legal and one thing is what is right. I mean, that's not all, always the same thing. Uh, I think for me, I normally photograph and I ask afterwards for two reasons. Number one, I think it's important to, to get pictures when the moment is the right moment. And the moment is rarely the right moment once a person say yes and turn around and smiles to you. That's not necessarily describing the right situation. However, if a person comes to me and say, I don't want a picture taken, I respect that. I don't use those pictures and I will take those pictures away. Uh, but this, is, this goes also back to um, what I said about it, creating relationships when you're photographing. And this relationship can take a second, they can take an hour, it depends on the situation. Uh, but I must say, most of the places in lots and lots of different locations that we're talking about now, where, where the migrants have been staying, in all these uh, abandoned buildings, most of these buildings are abandoned from the war. They were destroyed, burned down, and they just remained there. You know, a million people left the area of Bosnia Herzegovina during the 90s. <clears throat> there are a lot of empty buildings. Uh, then you approach people, and I would say 95% of the time we were welcomed with open arms. Uh, we were invited for food. We were. I took part in an iftar meal in the evening. Um, there were people taking us in, offering us tea, come and sit with us, come and be with. I mean, it was, that was not really a problem. There were a couple of buildings where the situation was a little bit different. I think there were a lot of people smugglers there, and that created a different dynamic amongst uh, the population. And when you're in an abandoned building with over 500 guys, you, you want to make sure that you feel comfortable being there too. Uh, and in these places, you can photograph, but there are always going to be someone who will tell you not to. Now, the situation is different if you're inside a camp, for example, and an IOM run camp. Uh, there we were not welcomed with open arms. Uh, we came, uh, I went to want to, I wanted to photograph the, the new Lipa camp because it was, that's a known camp in Bosnia that burned down uh, nearly two years ago now. Uh, that has later been rebuilt. And I wanted to photograph that area. And I came up there, we had documents with us and everything. And we realized we had to go all the way back to Sarajevo to get permission. That's a five hour drive. So we didn't do that on that moment. Uh, it didn't really matter because it, on our story, it wasn't the most important bit. And most of these refugees outside anyway, and people who came from, from the Lipa camp. Uh, but what bothered me in that area was that the camp is built in the middle of a landmine area. So there are full of landmines around the camp. And this is problematic on, on many, many levels because it's in the middle of the woods, far away from anything. Uh, and this is what I photographed. And this is also when I realized that there, people didn't want us to photograph that. And there were security coming up saying, you know, we cannot, you cannot photograph here. It's illegal and all that kind of stuff. I had to respectfully tell the guy that, sorry, but you're wrong. <laughs> I want to see this. Uh, and, and the guy walked away. He realized that, that I knew exactly what was legal or not. It's important to understand what the rules are. But if you work with people, you work on, a, as far as I'm concerned, on a one-on-one -on -one relationship and never carry long lenses. So I have to be close to people anyway. <laughs> they, they know that I'm photographing them. If I travel, I normally apply for a, a press visa because I want to be there and I want to be there on the correct terms. Uh, 
And if I'm uh, in an area, I don't know if it's public or private, I make sure I know. And as a rule of thumb, if it's public, you're fine. If, however, you take a picture, like this picture now, there he covers more than half of my photograph, uh, there's a good chance it's the main subject of the picture. In some areas, uh, that will be considered uh, that you need a permission of the person to be photographed. But if it's a newsworthy story, you don't need that permission. Okay, thanks, Christian, for that very detailed answer. Um, that uh, we need really to be aware of the rules as well as the human connection. We have a question coming in in the chat, um, which will be more directed towards Dina, about um, how to recognize climate change refugees or migrants in countries uh, that potentially might not recognize the existence of climate change. So I don't know if you have any comment on that. <laughs> I find it's a very tough question, but I, I find, you know, the, the, the question of denying, uh, uh, denying, in fact, climate change realities, it's often related to parts of government or a government in a given time, it doesn't reflect an overall maybe country position. And I think that when we have issues around uh, still not taking the evidence on climate change seriously, I find the question of having a refugee status on climate, it's not even the most pressing and difficult one. I think it's a question of uh, then rather of climate action policy, what, what can be done then in terms really of uh, global uh, heating of clean energy, of uh, degradation of uh, biodiversity and biodiversity loss. And often when we had situation uh, in the past, not far away with countries who are not very much um, uh, defending the vision that climate change is a reality and even withdrew from the Paris Agreement. Uh, what we use in my work, we, we focus more with um, these countries or these interlocutors on issues such as environmental degradation or uh, resource management. So at the end of the day, we touch upon the questions, but with a different angle. I yeah. think Yes, the question really on refugees, then it's, it's, it's too far, I think, for any of such country to even consider, give a consideration to, to the topic, I think. So um, I don't think that's a chance that anything happens there. If anything happens more in favor of recognition of people moving in the context of climate change, it comes from from countries that are deeply affected by climate change. So climate most vulnerable, um, the countries most vulnerable to, to climate change impacts. And also from champions uh, like the Nordic countries or from regions or from cities that are the forefront of the climate change battle. Okay, thanks. Again, it brings out the complexity of this issue and the need for nuance and to work across a broad range of sectors. Yes. Do we have any other questions from our audience? There's another one that's just... Oh, there's no one coming in. Thank you, Mark, for, for <laughs> flagging to me. Um, in terms of media... Sorry, thank you, Hannah, for your question. In terms of media and activism, rather than sharing personal stories, how can images help to shed light on truths? For example, the illegal acts of the Croatian border authorities. Yeah, Christian. Yes, that's a very good question. And a question that I have many opinions about because it's very true that, um, that there are a lot of illegal action happening on the Bosnian Croatian border. Um, unfortunately, there are illegal actions happening on the border between Slovenia and Croatia and Slovenia and Italy as well. I've met many people who uh, have been sent back, managed to walk all the way to Italy, and then only to be thrown all the way back to Bosnia again, as crossing two countries. And that's not legal. You cannot do that, but it happens. Uh, show pictures of that. There, there are pictures that are shown about that. 
there are many stories that explains this, but you really have to be good at investigating into media to find many of them at all. Uh, because they, they, for some reason, those stories don't sell very well uh, to the media. Uh, but there is the border crime, border violence investigation team, I think they're called something along those lines, who are taking, uh, they're, they're, they're writing detailed interviews they just published a big black book on uh, border violence recently. This is, we're talking less than a month ago, where they uh, published nearly 1,000 stories about illegal uh, action happening uh, on the borders. Uh, and the way that, so that's one thing. You can go that these publications are available for free. Uh, you can download them from the website. Uh, there are other sources of media too, because media is not always newspapers and traditional TV uh, stations. And a lot of NGOs too are um, spending resources on having journalists covering the work they do. Um, and for example, the Danish Refugee Council have published a lot of interesting information about what happens, particularly on the border between Bosnia and Croatia. A good friend of mine, Jan Grarup, an amazing photographer, uh, has covered a lot of work for them. Uh, and working directly with an NGO like the Danish Refugee Council means you have access to locations where the people who have been um, violently uh, treated the worst are spending their time. So uh, Jan was photographing, he showed me many of his pictures when he came back from Bihaj uh, of people who have been burned, been beaten up, have been uh, all their possessions stolen. Uh, he showed me one, uh, actually one, one story that stuck with me for a long time, or still does, was a person who managed to cross into Bosnia. He was caught, beaten up, all his clothes were burnt up, phones and money stolen. And this was in January. It was about minus seven or eight degrees. And he was thrown into the river between Bosnia and Croatia and managed to get up on the other side and ended up back again. I mean, he was he was nearly unconscious when he was found. I mean, he could not walk because he had broken his legs. So th this is the stuff that happens. And this was done by, uh, he, he did describe the people who did this. This was official Croatian border police. One of the stories listed in, in the, the big black book. Uh, so information exists for the moment. It's not gonna necessarily be a front page on your uh, daily paper. Uh, but the information are recorded, and there are also several other NGOs recording stories. I work closely with an, a small NGO called No Name Kitchen, uh, in the sense that they have used some of my work, but they have also helped me logistically a lot in the, in the Bihaj, Velika Kedusha region of Bosnia. Uh, they are doing amazing work helping people uh, with their needs, uh, food, etc. Simultaneously, they, they record what they see, who they meet, etc. Uh, the problem is in many of these places, and also including Bosnia, uh, it's illegal to do this kind of work. Uh, at the moment, I know of one organization who are working legally, and that's a local Bosnian organization. And they work on a small scale, but at least they do something. So they try to provide for these people um, when it's dark or in secret sort of thing. And, I could not go with them directly when they were working because they were too scared to be caught because they would be sent out of the country. Uh, and that's, they also have information on this. Thanks, Christian. So in terms of activism, maybe some of the truths are, entail, you know, are encompassed in these personal stories. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the truth, uh, in the end of the day, you have to rely on people. You meet people, you interview people, you record their stories. Uh, there are a lot of conspiracy theories that all these people probably in my pictures, some people would say they're all terrorists. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of crazy stories coming around about situations because a lot of people, unfortunately, including a lot of media, are basing truth on assumptions and assumptions is a dangerous thing. Um, it's better to see and record directly. This story too was now just recently published in Global Geneva, which is a news, a journal uh, online and in print uh, in this region, uh, where the target audience mostly are NGOs, schools, etc., where 
the philosophy of the magazine is only to publish stories that are done directly on sites. So there's no secondhand information going on in there. And the whole point is to have proper journalism happening. Exactly. And actually, I shared a link to Global Geneva um, article where you can find more information about Christian's work in the chat for anyone who's interested in checking that out. Um, OK, well, the, our hour is up, unfortunately. I'd like to say a huge thank you to both speakers for um, some really fascinating interventions. Uh, so thank you, Dina. Thank you, Christian. Um, what did I want to say to you? There we go. Um, yeah, so indeed, you can find more information about Christian's work in Global Geneva magazine, and you can find more information about our MA in Migration, Climate Change and the Environment um, in the link on our website, if that's of interest to anybody. Uh, but thank you ever so much to everybody who joined us. Um, thanks for stimulating the discussion, and uh, I hope to see you again at my next uh, Spotlight Seminar in the new year. So thanks very much. Stay healthy. I'm wishing everyone um, all the best for the holiday season in the current circumstances. Uh, take care care of yourselves. Goodbye. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Thanks. Sarah. Thank you to everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thanks.